The views and opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of Natural Bridges Media or KSQD staff, volunteers, or underwriters. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Jill Cody, and welcome to Be Bold America. Be Bold America is a live bi-weekly talk show for those who are motivated to step out with the actions necessary to begin reuniting this country and saving our democracy. And understanding and acting on what must be fixed is a huge step towards saving our democracy. Today's topic is Bold Solutions for a Democracy in Crisis. And we will be speaking with Johannes Epka, Legal Counsel for American Promise. American Promise is an organization located in Concord, Massachusetts, and is a national, nonprofit, nonpartisan, grassroots organization that advocates for a 28th Amendment to the United States Constitution that would allow the U.S. Congress and states to set reasonable limits on campaign spending. Johannes is a lawyer who spent most of his career working on elections and campaign finance reforms. He is a California native and a proud banana slug, class of 2005. Johannes is also a graduate of Lewis and Clark Law School in Portland, Oregon. He is currently on staff with American Promise and previously worked for Move to Amend. Welcome, Johannes. Thank you for joining us. Hello, Jill. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, in our studio, we have a guest, uh, Mike Rotkin. Mike is a five-time former mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, a glutton for punishment, I think, <laughs> who also taught for 42 years, another glutton for punishment, <laughs> at the UCSC Community Services Department. Mike currently does part-time organizing and grievance work for the University Council of the American Federation of Teachers and was also union president at UCSC, and he still teaches part-time at the university. Mike, welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you for coming into our studio and sharing some of your Sunday with us. So, Johann Johannes, to kick off this discussion, why don't you explain how we got into this mess, having dark, unaccountable money silently funding our democracy? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> so... I think when a lot of people think about the history of, of the United States or the history of democracy in the United States, we think about the struggles uh, of people to get the right to vote, of women, of uh, people of color, of uh, 18, 19, and 20 year olds. You know, we can we can think about the history of the United States as a as a struggle for the franchise, as the expansion of democracy in this country. And to a certain extent, that is absolutely true. Uh, at the same time, I, I think in this country we saw, have seen a, a slow erosion or undermining of, uh, of the democratic process in this country. And that comes in, in various forms. I think some are more familiar to folks than others. Um, gerrymandering, for example, even though more people have the right to vote, it's now politicians picking their voters instead of voters picking their politicians. Or uh, another concept that is very familiar to people in this country is, is the idea of big money influencing elections, dark money, anonymous money, but even just uh, even uh, disclosed donations of of millions and billions of dollars flowing into our elections uh, have undermined our ability to have an equal voice in the political process. And those have been uh, slow trends in this country that, that have been more insidious and, and less noticeable than the expansion of the franchise, sort of the, the pro-democracy uh, trends that we've seen in this country. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with the 2010 Citizens United decision, and, and that is really a, a cornerstone of uh, current campaign finance law in this country, this idea that um, that money spent to influence elections is a First Amendment uh, protected free speech right. That's what the, the court held in, in Citizens United in 2012. But it's actually a, an older doctrine that dates back to the 1970s. A case called Buckley v. Vallejo was, uh, was the first case the Supreme Court 
changed their minds on this issue of whether the question of political spending was a political question, something that the Congress and the states had the right to uh, to regulate and figure out, or whether it was a constitutional question, a First Amendment question, a speech question. Uh, and so they changed their mind in, in uh, Buckley v. Vallejo in the 70s and um, started eroding the limits on campaign uh, contributions that Congress and the, and the states had passed. And uh, there was uh, an expansion of, uh, of our campaign finance laws uh, in the 70s, and then uh, periodically uh, that law was uh, amended, and the Bipartisan Campaign Finance uh, Reform Act uh, was uh, commonly known as the McCain-Feingold Act, a, a truly bipartisan bill uh, from the early 2000s that Congress passed and uh, had a, a beneficial effect on, on political spending. And the court struck that down in, in Citizens United in, in 2010. And we've seen uh, an acceleration of that trend by the court to erode these limits on political spending. Um, McCutcheon and, and various other cases where it seems like the trend is, is very clearly that the court is seeing this as a First Amendment free speech issue, that Congress and the states aren't allowed to put any limits on, on political spending. And the impacts have been disastrous. Uh, we've seen something like $40 billion spent in the last 20 years in, in elections in this country. This 2020 upcoming election seems very clearly like it's going to be the most expensive. And, and the impact that that has is that the, the elected officials now think about their uh, donors more than they think about their constituents. And uh, I'll get into more of sort of the current state of affairs uh, when we get to that portion. But uh, that's the, the trend in the history of, of democracy in this country that, that we're looking at very closely. Thank you, Johannes. Mike? Thanks for that. Uh, I would just add that this move towards empowering corporations to have eventually what becomes civil rights begins a lot earlier in our history. Initially, corporations were sort of creatures of the state. They uh, could only be established with a charter that had a public, we're establishing a public purpose of some kind. And what we've seen since the history of the starting of the United States is a sort of slow move towards empowering corporations to act as people. And it, it was uh, f sort of funny when uh, uh, President, presidential candidate Romney announced one, in one uh, campaign speech that, you know, my friends, corporations are people, and everybody was just shocked and, and amazed. But of course, that's what Citizens United actually uh, uh, consolidated in the end. But it's been a long process that we've been moving towards the empowerment of corporations, first with property rights, uh, which they didn't have initially, the right to go to court, federal court, and sue, uh, protect their interests against various states, uh, which which happened uh, over almost 200 years ago now, and then slowly moving towards these, uh, basically what are civil rights. I think even going beyond the Citizens United when they went to the Hobby Lobby case where they actually then got religious rights as a corporation. Again, not the individuals in the corporation or the, the particular owners or even shareholders, but the corporation itself as a, as a person or body. So uh, what you've told us about, I think, is, is really really, really important. And it's, it didn't just start with Citizens United. It's a sort of glide path we've been on for a very, very long time. And there's no question that it completely disrupts the democratic process when you have people with a lot of money determining who's going to be uh, representing them, and whether it's at the congressional level or even local government. Well, more money gets more free speech. <laughs> right. And also corporations, you know, if they were a person, they'd be a psychopath. <laughs> they have no uh, humility, compassion, or empathy. They are a, a construct, and so they make psychopathic uh, decisions. Well, it's interesting. Blackstone, going way back in English history before we even had the United States, had noted that you know, uh, corporations, of which there were a few at the time, corporations couldn't be incarcerated, and therefore it was hard, sort of hard to think of them as having the court rights or the right to get to the legal system in some way, because you couldn't lock them up. And I always thought about that when, when Citizens United happened. I would sort of like, I'll, I'll believe you know, corporations are people. When we can, when we can actually like put them in jail, but it doesn't work that way. No, Johannes, you were talking about how we got here, and I think it's also important for people to understand elections matter, appointments to the Supreme Court matter, and 
in my view, one of the people that got us here was Lewis Powell. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about him? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Uh, and, and also, thank you so much, Mike, for, for fleshing out the, the corporate rights uh, issue. It's such an important component of this as well, and, and certainly something that I hope we have some time to uh, to focus on. So, yeah, um, to, to answer your question, Lewis Powell, a lot of people look at him as one of the architects of the current campaign finance scheme or uh, the designers of this uh, this concept of getting the court to, uh, to deem political spending free speech. He was originally, I think he was actually a tobacco industry lawyer and yes. uh, was at one point also uh, employed or uh, in contract uh, by the um, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and uh, eventually ended up on the court and um, and and voted on several very consequential decisions uh, in this arena in the 70s and 80s. And um, he is maybe best known in this realm, though, for writing what is uh, commonly called the Powell Memo for the Chamber of Commerce, and it was essentially a. Uh, a blueprint for how commercial interests could gain more influence in politics and uh, and in the economy in this country. And it was a several part plan. I can't speak to all of them, but there was one component that was an explicit call to uh, appoint members to the court, appoint justices to the court, um, who were activist-minded and favorable to this concept of expanding uh, rights for corporations, and in particular, the First Amendment right to uh, to spend money in elections. That was really a, a key uh, goal of uh, of the commercial interests of that era, and uh, I think they. Uh, executed it perfectly. And uh, I should note, it also was not revealed until he was already on the court that Powell had written this memo uh, outlining this game plan. That was something that was subsequently uh, unearthed and revealed. Um, And I imagine it caused quite a stir. I think it's really key about this person, too, because if anyone wants to look it up, his Powell Memo or Powell Manifesto was written on August 23, 1971. And interestingly, um, President Nixon appointed him to the Supreme Court. So when you were talking about Buckley versus Vallejo and also the First Bank of Boston versus Bilotti, he was instrumental in uh, giving money, you know, uh, free speech rights to corporations. Mike? Uh, an important part of that memo is where where he uh, advocates very strongly for corporations taking a more active role in getting themselves into court to gather these rights. Because the history before his memo had really been typically corporations would be dragged into court by others or they would have a particular case of their own that they wanted to resolve if they had a problem. Some state was telling them they had to pay a huge state license fee or something and they didn't want to have that happen. But he was arguing that they needed to get into court to actually just in general strengthen their rights. And it it was just so nakedly clear what he was trying to do was have the corporations sort of advocate for themselves as people in effect uh, that they have rights and they need to defend them and so forth and to get rid of the kind of passive notion that they'll go to court when they have to and of course spend money and be well defended but this idea was they they should create an agenda to get themselves into court and expand their rights. You're listening to Be Bold America on KSQD 90.7 FM, your ink spot on the dial. You may listen worldwide online at ksqd.org. We're speaking with American Promise uh, Johannes Epka and Mike Rodkin, five-time mayor of Santa Cruz. I'm your host, Jill Cody. Now, um, Johannes, the corporate rights question. We were just sort of talking about corporate rights. You wanted to flesh that out? Yeah, sure. And I, I'm glad we, we dove right in, but I think it is worth taking a step back and seeing how these two issues, money as free speech and corporations as people or, or the concept that a corporation has the same constitutional rights as, as natural living human beings, are are distinct doctrines but are very intimately related uh, in Citizens United and and other contexts. But uh, just to make clear what the boundaries of these two doctrines are, money as speech is an idea that anybody, whether it be a person or a corporation spending money, has a has a free speech right to spend as much money as they want to influence an election. 
The corporate rights question is uh, an issue where corporations can claim, again, these First Amendment rights to free speech, but also uh, other unrelated to political spending rights, so rights of uh, due process or equal protection under the law, um, you know, rights that were originally not envisioned to be granted to artificial entities. In fact, the word corporation doesn't appear anywhere in the Constitution or amendments. And so all of this law about corporate rights uh, is completely judge-made. It's, um, it's legal fabrication. It's, it's a legal fiction, essentially. And it's one that the courts created essentially as... Uh, uh, to make it easier to deal with corporations. You know, the early um, history of this country, corporations, as, as Mike spoke about um, earlier, uh, the courts didn't really know what to do with them, what they were. They were just aggregations of people. So, sure, let's give those aggregations of people the same rights as those people. Now, obviously, when people gather into groups, they don't give up any rights. And we're not talking about this concept of a a legal entity, a corporation being used to assert the rights of, of natural living human beings. We're actually talking about creating uh, completely new rights for, for these entities as entities. And that's a, that's a really important distinction because, for example, a, a union or a nonprofit is, uh, is generally an, an incorporated entity. And there are some times when we want those entities to be able to go to court and say, hey, listen, I, we as union representatives, are. this union is suing to assert, to enforce, to vindicate the rights of our members. We want unions or nonprofits or maybe even in some cases for-profit corporations to be able to do that. What we don't want them to be able to do is overturn democratically enacted laws by claiming that their rights have been violated. So I'll, I'll give you some, some what I think are egregious examples of that. Um, equal protection, 14th Amendment equal protection rights uh, originally passed to protect recently free slaves, obviously. And corporations jumped right on this equal protection, the idea that if a corporation is a person, then all corporations have to be treated the same. So corporations have successfully used their corporate rights to overturn laws that treat, for example, big box stores differently than mom and pop or locally owned stores or big multinational corporations or, or in-state versus out-of-state. And uh, these are uh, generally in the context of a zoning law or a tax law. And so states and municipalities and even Congress cannot pass laws that discriminate, quote-unquote, discriminate against a corporation's equal rights. That, to me, seems like uh, not the original intent of the 14th Amendment, certainly, and a, a, a departure from, from a, a democratic society if the owners of a corporation can overturn laws uh, that the rest of us really want to have, then that seems um, inherently undemocratic. Now, let me add that, you know, that one of the ironies here is that the conservative movement typically makes the claim in terms of the court that they are in favor of sort of uh, original intent of the framers. That when they they argue, we shouldn't you know the liberal court they they charge the liberal court, the Warren court for example in the 60s and 70s, with the uh, early 70s with the idea that uh, they're making up laws that really should be the job of the legislature and we're just trying to get back in touch with what the framers meant when they wrote the Constitution and so the idea that the 14th Amendment which never mentions corporations en enabled corporations to have equal protection or uh, protection against search and seizure you know when you actually and you can see some of this in President Trump's recent claims, sort of indirectly, the idea that somehow he's been, uh, the, 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 the uh, government's been spying on him. Uh, the, yeah, they, they were investigating him, and they had a right to look for questions, and his argument is like, well, you don't have a right to look into my, my material and stuff because I, I'm, you know, I'm protected against this. Well, you have a right to investigate folks, and you should be able to compel a corporation to produce its records and materials. And there have been cases where they, the courts have sort of, they've never given an absolute uh, protection against any search or seizure, but they've really restrained the ability of government to go after corporations and get into their corporate records, as hard as that might be. And you can't even get to it when the courts are telling you you're, you're violating their Fourth Amendment rights when you do that. That's a real problem. Now, bringing this 30,000-foot you know, level discussion down to uh, 
And I'm going to use the word uh, where the rubber meets the road because it applies to what I'm going to say next. In that, there's a book called Slow Death by Rubber Duck. Um, by Rick Smith and Bruce Laurie, and to talk about um, not being able to get records or keep corporations accountable, th- how this personhood really comes into play, for example, with um, chemicals. There, there are what, we, what are called secret chemicals, and people can't find out what the chemical makeup is. And in the book, they talk about a situation where uh, there was a chemical spill at a plant, uh, the, the worker had gotten had been brought to the hospital, and um, the nurse that uh, um, was wait, you know taking care of him um, got ill as well, and it, she got so ill that the doctor started calling the chemical company saying, "What's in this? We don't know how to treat her." And they said, "We don't have to tell you; it's secret." Right. You could, they couldn't get the information that they needed. So we're talking about corporate personhood. And how we can't get uh, information and, and materials from them and records. And this is how it plays out in real life. Johannes? Yeah, it's shocking some of the claims that they will make uh, that they have a constitutional right to. Uh, ExxonMobil uh, has similarly uh, claimed that they have a, a First Amendment right not to speak about what they knew about climate change back in the day or, or all sorts of things. This idea that uh, that a corporation has a right not to speak or that a corporation has a search and seizure uh, protection in the Constitution. Or a Fifth Amendment is, that they don't have to testify against themselves. I mean, trying that one. That has not yet been confirmed, but they're working on that one, I think. Right, absolutely. I think that there's a very deliberate effort to ex- continue expanding these rights into these really bizarre realms and uh, with, with very real and, and unfortunate consequences. Well, one of the things we should, just to this background, when you think about corporations, it's not that every corporation does horrible things and never produces any good for anybody. Obviously, corporations make things that we need, and there's those kinds of issues. But there's a really interesting case from the Supreme Court in 1919, in which the Dodge brothers uh, went after Henry Ford. They used to work in the same company, and um, Ford had announced that he was going to start selling cars very cheaply, and he was going to pay his workers a lot more money than the industry typically was paying. And his argument was, whether he was, you know, whether this was disingenuous or not, his argument was, I'm doing this for the good of the community. People will be paid more, we'll be able to, he wasn't saying this will be good for the long-term prospect of our company. His argument was it's good for the community. And the courts ruled in that case that he had a, that the Ford Motor Company had an absolute fiduciary responsibility to protect the interests of its shareholders and not the community, not its employees, not the you know any any of the kind of public good. That, that defending the public good was not the job of a corporation. And this is a U- U.S. Supreme Court decision in 1919, Dodge Brothers versus Ford Motor Company, in which they decide that corporations must maximize their profit for their uh, for their uh, shareholders, and that's their only real responsibility. Now, just to fast forward from 1919 to last month. Um, Johannes, this might be taking us off topic a little bit, but I think we can bring it back. Because while I had you on the phone, I wanted to ask your um, your uh, reaction to the Supreme Court's 5-4 ruling last month, which upheld partisan power and the uh, uh, Rucho versus Common Cause by approving gerrymandering electoral mm-hmm. districts in favor of entrenched political interests. Saying this is bad for democracy is an understatement. I see it as a significant blow to our democracy as uh, Citizens United was and Buckley versus Vallejo and McCutcheon. Your thoughts? Oh, oh, certainly. I think it was a a hugely consequential decision. Sort of interestingly, they did in that case what we hoped they would have done in Citizens United, which is say, (laughs) this is actually a political question. The court doesn't have any business waiting in here which is, you know, would have been great in Citizens United if they had let Congress and the states continue regulating, not that we had, you know, a perfect democracy in 2009, but that would have been a great outcome. In the the gerrymandering case, it's it's certainly a a blow to our democracy. I I will say I think there's one difference between that and the Citizens United case that, um, that is important to note, which is states can still pass 
uh, gerrymandering reforms. For example, California and Arizona and others have passed independent redistricting commission reforms by ballot initiative or through the state legislature. Uh, and the court did not invalidate any of those uh, alternative um, schemes or solutions, essentially, to the partisan gerrymandering problem in those states. We were just hoping that they would uh, abolish all partisan gerrymandering in all 50 states and make it easier so we don't have to go state by state. And, and that was very United, different. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Go ahead, Mike. That, that was very different than Citizens United, where it's interesting because typically the court, uh, and this is again a conservative argument from the court for decades now, that they should only rule in the most narrow way. If they can resolve a case without coming to some large constitutional issue, but just you know send it back to the lower court on some minor technicality, that would be typically be their way of approaching things. But in Citizens United, the court. Nobody, none of the the plaintiff in the in the case was not asking that the court um, create this you know absolute citizens right uh, as they did in Citizens United. They were simply asking for relief in a particular case, and the court had a lot of other options. And they talked about in the, in, in the uh, dissenting dis opinion the possibility that they simply they might have decided for the plaintiff, but not have reached such a broad conclusion about the rights of the, the uh, civil rights of corporations. But the court actually made law in effect. I mean, they went, they did exactly what they're saying the liberals had been doing by establishing the, 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 taking the case way beyond what any of the plaintiffs had required or requested. There had been no discussion in front of the court about actually coming to that broad a conclusion, and yet that's what they decided to do in the end, and that's the activism Powell had been pushing for. Now, Johannes, this, uh, it, I feel a little better knowing that the states can still pass their um, gerrymandering uh, uh, laws, but Gerrymandering then creates maybe a Republican held legislature like Wisconsin that I don't remember the actual amounts, but Wisconsin, the Republicans hold at least three quarters, at least a supermajority of the legislature, and yet the Democrats receive more votes. And that seems to lead to the question of how can um, the 28th Amendment be successful when so many state legislatures are held in Republican hands? Well, that's a, that's a really interesting question from our sort of political strategy standpoint. We see, actually, when we go out into the country and have conversations with Americans of all political stripes, we get very near consensus on this issue of uh, we, and the need for an amendment to address Citizens United and political spending on both sides of the political aisle. And indeed, American Promise, we call ourselves cross-partisan. We think that everybody should bring their partisanship to the table and not put their, uh, you know, their political ideology on hold or anything like that. But uh, we certainly have a lot of support from um, from Republicans, and um, it's just an issue of translating that into votes in both Congress and in uh, in state legislatures. And I think it also uh, helps to illuminate how these issues are all really very intimately tied. Uh, it was uh, the Republican strategy in, in 2000 before that uh, census and redistricting to spend some really concerted money uh, in a few states to grab state legislatures so that they could have control over those. So the big money feeds the gerrymandering, the gerrymandering defends the big money, and uh, there's a bunch of other issues sort of woven in there. But these are these are all really related issues. One more issue that I wanted to, to raise on the, the difference between this recent Supreme Court case and Citizens United is um, as we discussed, fortunately, there are things that states can do on gerrymandering, but there is very little that many of the states can do on the political spending issue. In fact, after Citizens United, something like half of the states either had to rescind existing laws or stop enforcing them because they knew that what they had on the books would be deemed unconstitutional. Montana, I think, was the only state that challenged that and tried to keep their their hundred year old corrupt practices act in place, and uh, and the court sent them packing, saying, "No, you uh, you state don't have any special right to uh, to understand how your uh, campaign finance system in your state works. Uh, you have to comply with." what the Constitution is now interpreted to mean. You 
are listening to Be Bold America on KSQD, Many Voices, One Station. I'm Jill Cody, and we're going to get back to our guests, Johannes Epka and Mike Rotkin, in a minute. Hi, I'm Amy Goodman, host of Democracy Now! Tune in to our award-winning morning news program right here during primetime, 8 o'clock weekday mornings, right here on K-Squid, on KSQD. Our independent news program offers diverse perspectives, unique opinions unheard in the mainstream media, live as the news unfolds. Tune in for Democracy Now!, the War and Peace Report, weekday mornings at 8, right here on KSQD Community Radio, 90.7 FM. Hello, K-Squid listeners. I'm Todd Hartman, and each weekday at 4 p.m., I bring you a different perspective on the news than you're likely to hear on most media outlets. Please join me on KSQD Santa Cruz, your ink spot on the dial for the Tom Hartman program. Heard now for the first time ever in the Monterey Bay area at 90.7 FM, weekdays at 4 p.m. That's Progressive Talking Conversation with me, Tom Hartman, weekdays at 4 p.m. on KSQD 90.7 FM. Tag, you're it. And we're back with our guests, Johannes Epka, the Council to American Promise, and Mike Rodkin, five-time former mayor of Santa Cruz and University of California Santa Cruz professor. Um, okay, you By were... Way, I'm not actually a professor. I'm a lecturer there. A lecturer now. We have, a, but we have, you, a, we have No, I've never been a professor. Oh, really? We have a caste system, and I've been uh, basically a temporary <laughs> worker for 40, <laughs> over 45 years now. <laughs> well, I'm thinking of professor with a lowercase p. That would so. be correct. <laughs> Johannes, um, you know, you were getting into political spending, too. You wanted to share more about that? Sure. Uh, well, there was, I was just thinking about something like Mike said earlier about um, corporations being useful tools. And before we turn from that subject completely, okay. I wanted to just a- a- agree that uh, we at American Promise certainly see corporations as very, very helpful and valuable tools in concentrating capital to make investments and such. And in fact, we actually have very substantial business support behind what we're doing. And I think part of the reason for that is that businesses know is that in order to compete in this world, in, in this current campaign finance realm, that they actually need to engage in that kind of uh, you know, quasi quid pro quo influence and access buying, and that's not what most corporations in this country are good at doing or want to spend their time doing. And so, we've seen a, a really strong response from the from the business community saying, "Look, let's have a, a level playing field. We just want to get back to what we do best, and we don't want to have to deal with." Uh, with all of this, you know, um, murky political territory. And so uh, I just wanted to, to add that to that sentiment that this isn't in any way an anti-corporate or, um, uh, you know, anti-business perspective at all, that this is really something that business uh, agrees with strongly. You know, one other quick thing we should point out to the listeners is uh, you talked earlier um, about the Buckley decision, and th- that was a decision basically that determined, as best I understand it, that... Uh, you, you uh, could not spend, uh, uh, corporations couldn't spend money, as much money as they wanted. They were subject to limits still uh, on uh, uh, political campaigns for candidates, but that it was um, basically, it was, that it was, <clears throat> there were, you, it was still okay to limit the access to corporations controlling those elections, but that it, it gave them the right to spend whatever they needed to spend on uh issue campaigns, ballot measures, and things like that. And it's, it's over time, even before it got to Citizens United, you can see the kind of bleeding into the process where the Buckley decision has really limited the ability or the belief of local governments that they can regulate anything about the, the corporate spending or the spending of the spending limits in general on folks. And Buckley's was not even about corporations per se. It was just that there's no limit on what people can spend on uh, the wealthy basically can spend on on uh, campaigns, and as somebody who ran for office six times successfully in my case, um, it, it's a real problem. You, you you're faced with the city government. We tried to pass uh, campaign spending rules in Santa Cruz, and you realize in the end you really have to make them voluntary. And in the end, you're, you're only left with the ability to sort of get people to subscribe to the idea of a campaign spending limit and hope that that wins over voters. But you can't really stop your opponents from outspending you. 
in any way, and that's a serious, serious problem, and it forces you into going out to raise money, and I've never had the problem myself personally of you know, feeling like I owe anybody something because they gave me a big contribution. My contributions were typically pretty small, so I'm hardly going to sell my soul for, you know, my average campaign contribution to my first campaign was $5.07, but, but, you know, when people give you thousands of dollars for a campaign, you start to feel like, at least, you know, as they say, at least they have access to you. Um, people start to pay attention to what their concerns are, and you're a little more careful not to uh, do something you think might really uh, outrage them, especially if you're planning to run for office again. And if you think about people in Congress who have to run every two years for office, as soon as they're elected, they're immediately beginning to think, what do I need to do to get elected again? Who do I have to get, go to see for money and make this stuff happen? And it, it completely corrupts the electoral process. Johannes? Absolutely. I, I think that there's, um, I, I'm sure you have some listeners uh, that are thinking, I can't believe we're talking about campaign finance and the, the problems that we have, and nobody has mentioned super PACs yet. <laughs> right. So I, I thought it worth uh, at least explaining how some of these things fit together, contributions, political spending, lobbyists, and such. And so um, the court in Buckley declared that the only legitimate government interest to put limitations on on political spending is quid pro quo corruption, the idea that if I give you this money for your campaign, that you will pass this law for me or do something in, in return for me. So so remember, we're, we're talking about free speech and putting limitations on that. And that's something that we actually do fairly regularly in this country. You can't shout fire in a crowded theater, right? That's the example that everybody uses. Um, you're not allowed to um, disseminate hate speech. There are certain areas where we as a society, or the court at least, gets to decide that, that limits on free speech are okay. And they have said that quid, in order to co uh, combat quid pro quo corruption, that Congress and the states can pass laws. And so what that means is they have been able to pass laws limiting direct contributions. So if somebody's running for office, there's a limit on how much money I can give them directly. However, the court has said that there is no legitimate government interest in limiting systemic corruption or dependence corruption, this idea that the whole political system has been corrupted by this by this flood of political spending, uh, that is not, in the court's view, a legitimate government interest. And so what that means is that as long as I'm not contributing to, directly to your election or coordinating with you, I can spend as much money as I want, literally unlimited money, as long as I'm not coordinating with the candidate or, or giving any of that money to them. And so these entities are called independent expenditure only PACs, and those are the super PACs. And that's what they do. They ostensibly don't coordinate with the candidate, though generally it's a former campaign chair that sets up the super PAC for them. And there's this, you know, wink and nod, and we're not coordinating. Uh, and there's there's no potential for quid pro quo corruption there, and therefore there is no government interest in um, in putting limitations on that kind of political spending. And so. It is, it is that really narrow definition of corruption that the court has taken uh, that has allowed for these independent expenditure only tax to really proliferate and um, spend a ton of money in our in our elections. And, and we actually have you know, concrete examples where independent expenditure groups took the campaign literature from not the whole piece, they couldn't do that. That would be obviously, you know, coordination. But took uh, pictures, uh, information from a campaign, used that in their information that they put out to the uh, to the voting public, and so it's not coordinated. But it certainly it's as you said, a wink and a nod best describes what's going on. You have people who've been involved together in the past. They're running an independent campaign, and they're using the same literature, the same quotes, the same photographs as comes out of the the uh, actual campaign literature from the campaign itself. So the idea that it's truly an independent expenditure is quite absurd. And whereas it might make some sense to have independent expenditures on ballot measures where people don't necessarily coordinate with the group that's running the ballot measure but has a different point of view but likes the idea of what the ballot measure is going to do, I don't even understand how it's possible to imagine an independent expenditure campaign that's working for a candidate but that somehow doesn't immediately involve the same questions of corruption that it would have if they gave the money directly. Johannes? Yeah, I think, you know, there's, there's, it's very clear that the candidates know who is doing this spending, and it's very clear 
what those uh, forces making those expenditures want in return. That's where the lobbyists come in, right? These major corporations generally or other big spending special interests will send their lobbyists to an incumbent and say, look, we want this. We plan to do a bunch of spending under this super PAC in the next election. Uh, you know, let's... Uh, Let's uh, let's figure it out. And, um, and if the candidate doesn't play ball, then they know that they won't get that same independent, quote unquote, independent expenditure the next time they're up for office. I think you're you're exactly right, Mike. That it's um, you know it's that up for re-election where they're most vulnerable, or, or where this influence of uh, of the um, the PACs comes in. And uh, so that's exactly where we try to get them to. You know, obviously, a candidate only gets elected if uh, if they get the most votes. And um, you know, as much as we are cynical about uh, the influence that money has, it certainly has a, an outsized influence. But it's not the only thing. Ultimately, these candidates need to face the voters too. And so we're coming at them with a candidate pledge that they won't um, that they will support the twenty eighth amendment. Uh, and we're trying to turn voters out in that way to support candidates that are supportive of solutions uh, rather than uh, them hearing the voters only hearing uh, from these super PACs or attack ads or uh, other sources they may uh, they may hear from. Hi, I have a question, if I could, uh, sure. of our uh, all the uh, phone guests. I. What what right do we have to uh, governments, state or local governments, have to regulate the reporting of uh, expenditures? In other words, it's one thing to say that you can spend as much as you'd like, and that uh, is it is Citizens United. And I don't understand the answer. I really this is a real question for me. To what extent Citizens United stops us or doesn't stop us from uh, passing laws or rules and governance so forth that people have to report their expenditures rather than continue to be dark money? I don't know if you could comment on that. Sure, I'd be happy to. So the, the court actually, Kennedy and his majority in Citizens United, uh, relied on disclosure uh, as part of his rationale, the idea that as long as the voters knew who was making the, the expenditures, who was spending the money, that a, a, an informed voter could look at that expenditure and say, hey, maybe this person is more corrupt. They could, they could enter that into their calculus about who to vote for or uh, where, the, where the candidate stood on issues. And so uh, the court actually thought that uh, very robust disclosure would be uh, in place as, as part of the post-Citizens United world. And obviously that has not come to pass. And um, Kennedy has made some statements that he may or may not have been naive about that component of it. Um, states and uh, local governments can pass laws requiring some disclosure, but the federal rules essentially trump that. And there are a lot of sort of interesting case uh, studies being pushed through the courts and groups trying to pass state disclosure laws to sort of test the limits of that. Um, we actually technically have pretty robust federal disclosure laws. All of these super PACs have to disclose their donors, but they essentially just use a shell game. What they do is they have the big corporate or billionaire donors give money to a, a 501c4, a, a sort of semi-political nonprofit group. Those are the ones that are frequently called dark money groups. And then the 501c4 will actually do the donation to the super PAC, and the super PAC will disclose the 501c4 as the donor. And so we do actually require that super PACs disclose donors. They just end up disclosing the most immediate donor. And uh, the federal government has, has not uh, found its way to resolving or closing that loophole. But there's nothing in the Constitution or, or how the court has interpreted it that would put any limits on uh, on state or local disclosure requirements. Thank you. You're listening to Be Bold America on KSQD 90.7 FM, serving Santa Cruz and the Monterey Bay. 
Tune in to KSQD this weekend for State of Mind, hosted by Santa Cruz's own Deborah Sloss. This month's topic is seniors and loneliness. Deborah looks at the issues facing seniors who are isolated and solutions to help overcome these issues. State of Mind airs Saturday afternoon at 1 p.m. and Sunday evening at 6 p.m. here on KSQD 90.7 FM and ksqd.org. We're speaking with America Promises Legal Counsel Johannes Epka and Mike Rodkin, five-time mayor of Santa Cruz and UCSC lecturer. I'm your host, Jill Cody. And, you know, to just point out what an important issue this is, um, it's a number one issue for 50 million people in this country, is is getting money out of politics. And and um, there was a study by Gillens and Page from a Princeton and Northwestern University. Um, uh, their article was uh, called Testing Theories of American Politics, Elites, Interest Groups, and Average Citizens. And they said when preferences of economic elites and the stands of organized interest groups are controlled, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. And this study of 107, well, 1,771 bills was before Citizens United. Um, I can only imagine that it's gotten worse, and I can only assume that the word minuscule can now be replaced with none. <laughs> so I think, Johannes, what you're what your um, uh, nonprofit is doing, American Promise, is really exceptionally re um, important. And not only are you carrying the water for 50 million people that make it a number one issue, you're actually really working for all of us. Um, do you have, um, you know, any keep start stops for um, people who are listening? Um, what they can do to reunite this country and save our democracy and and help with this issue and help with American Promise, and maybe we can take that individually. Um, uh, do you have ideas of what we can keep doing? Sure, absolutely, and uh, I'll respond to your very generous description of uh, American Promise carrying the water by saying that there are actually several groups, um, many groups involved in the amendment effort, and we coordinate with them frequently. And so- Excellent. Uh, uh, on, on that uh, on that issue, I would say one thing that your listeners could keep doing is informing yourselves about the issues. You know, that's certainly not something that I could say most Americans should keep doing because I suspect that a lot of Americans are not. But uh, you know, anybody listening to this show, uh, kudos! You're you're doing your homework. You're uh, you're getting informed. You're learning what the what the concerns are. And more importantly, what the solutions are. I think knowing what the problems are is, is uh, uh, only a small part of it. Understanding uh, the many, many solutions that we have to, uh, to these issues uh, is a really crucial component of that. Mike? Well, I would say as far as what people should keep doing, we agree completely. So I would just say it's like people have to be informed about what's going on. It's it's so easy to sort of be swept off into other issues and people, the attention people pay. And, and it's not that people shouldn't do any of these things, but when your whole life is swept up in sports, uh, passive observation of sports teams playing and uh, and no interest at all in how your government actually operates and how things get decided both at the local and state and then federal level. There's a real problem. And so people need to figure out what for them. I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, suggest that I know the answer for where people should get all of their information, but people need to find sources that they have some confidence in that actually give them information about what's going on. And it's so easy to just uh, get disgusted and let it slide and think, well, there's nothing I can do. And I don't believe that's the case. I think there's something we can do about this, but you, you can't do very much if you don't know what's going on. And uh, Johannes, what can listeners stop doing? I actually thought most about this one. The keep and start were easy, but uh, telling people to stop doing something is uh, it's hard to do, you know. And the, the one that I very delicately chose was I want to encourage Americans to stop thinking that voting for the right candidate or if we could just get the right candidate in that that would fix everything. I think my, uh, in a nutshell, my stop would be stop putting all of our collective eggs in the, the candidate race basket. 
We really need more systemic reform than that. Even if we had great candidates, we're throwing them into a, a completely corrupted system. It's not their fault that they can't, you know, that our the good ones in Congress can't get anything done. It's not that there aren't enough of them or that they're not good enough or, or any of that. It's really that this, this political system, our electoral system, is corrupted, and we really need to focus on that, not the sort of symptom of that, which is that bad candidates are more likely to run and more likely to get elected and more likely to pad, pass bad laws. That's certainly something that we need to to keep focusing on as well. But I would say to stop putting so much focus uh, on on the candidate races. It's my my issue here is related, but it's not exactly the same. And that is, I think. We spent far too much time thinking that electoral politics and the voting itself is the only thing we can do politically. And as a result, when it comes to an election, people are saying, well, I'm only going to vote for someone who perfectly reflects my view of the way the world ought to be. I'm going to only vote for the perfect candidate. That's why people sit it out when Hillary Clinton's running against Donald Trump, for example. She's not perfectly what I'd like, so I'm just going to like, no, I don't like either of them. And we have to realize that there's political work to be done between elections. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't vote in elections. I think people need to do that. But we should seriously be thinking about who who can get elected in, in this upcoming presidential election, for example, and not to name any candidates here because I don't have a horse I'm backing. But I think people need to be thinking, well, what can I do to change the context so when people are running for office, they're running in a situation where they can get stuff done because I've created helped create a movement that's going to back a particular reform that I'd like to see happen, such as the 28th Amendment issue we're working on. Or, um, stuff to do with climate uh, change and so forth. And so people have to think about politics, not just something that happens once every two years or every four years as some citizens only vote then, but actually what can you do politically in between to, to change the context so that you'll have better candidates that you that are closer to your position when it gets to an election. It's not all about the election. And the idea that I'm not going to vote for somebody who doesn't perfectly reflect my dream of who I'd like to have in office, that's a, that's a way to get Donald Trump reelected. Well, and I'd like to add to uh, to stop is is for people to stop thinking they can't make a difference. I think that mindset um, leads to some of the bad decisions that get made because they just don't pay, um, participate because it, what, what can I do? And you know, that's why I like to have this uh, keep, stop, start conversation because there are th- lots of things people can do. So I want people to stop thinking they can't make a difference and also to stop talking, um, even though we're talking right now, uh, we all need to be jump-started. But, but really, uh, there was a book called The Knowing Doing Gap uh, by business management consultants uh, Pfeiffer and Sultan. And what they determined was is that people feel when they've been talking that they've actually done something. And they haven't. And I think that what what's worse now with Twitter and uh, Facebook, people are very active on that, and they think they've done something. But they haven't really to make a difference. Um, they haven't called up their um, a representative or joined American Promise and, and helping fund uh, your organization and other organizations um, that are fighting for the 28th Amendment. They haven't. So realize that talking, misery does love, does love company. But knowing that talk, talking isn't necessarily doing anything, and, and watch for the difference. Well, I think social media is a useful tool for helping mm-hmm. organize things, but it's not the organizing. <laughs> it's the place where it might begin, but eventually people have to find a way to actually express their, their views in the body politic. Use and it ulti- as that tool. Ultimately, for going to a meeting, going to a, help organize an event or an activity, or in the vote, register voters, do the kinds of things that actually will make a difference in the end. Yes, and then, Johannes, start doing... <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, getting involved, getting coordinated, uh, all of those things. Uh, as you mentioned, Jill, uh, joining American Promise uh, is the first way to find out about what we're up to nationally. We certainly have an online presence. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And we use those, as Mike said, to do the actual organizing. We have a national grassroots chapter structure. We're starting American Promise Associations all over the country as we speak, uh, and then using those uh, concerted uh, efforts of, of individuals, of citizen leaders in those communities to pressure members of Congress to get on board, to lobby a state uh, legislature to pass a resolution in support of the amendment. We're seeing a ton of activity on this on the 28th Amendment right now. New Hampshire just passed last month 
a resolution adding them to the list of states calling on Congress to, to pass this amendment. They are the 20th state, and there are several more that, that seemed poised to, uh, to join them. And so we're really looking at that. Uh, get involved locally, build up to the state level, and let's uh, let's create this democracy movement. We need to make America an actual functioning democracy. Well, my view is that also people need to, and this maybe is, uh, reflects my uh, old foginess or something. But I don't. Th- I think people need to actually go to real meetings with people. We don't. We don't do well at meetings. We've been. We've learned how to not be effective in uh, working with each other and so forth. But it, when you're isolated by yourself and you only watch the news by yourself, even if you do pay attention and get informed and know what's going on, it can become very depressing and very uh, demobilizing. And I think having a group of people, friends, the actual, maybe, you know, maybe I'm just too old to appreciate it could be done online, but I think actual organizations in your community where you can sit down with people and talk about politics and what it is you can do uh, together to make a difference is really something that's important. It gives you a sense of uh, uh, the possibilities of activism, which you kind of lose. Even Again, even all my life I've been an activist, but if I spend too long away from other people and just sort of listen to the news, read the paper, I just read three papers a day, you just get depressed and you go like, oh, it's so hopeless. What can you do? But when I end up talking to friends who share my views and we understand that I, I'm not alone in this, that I have other people that share my views and we can make a difference, it really... it. Uh, it changes things for you. So I, I think getting active with other people in your community is really something important. And also, I, I like to encourage people to start reading the Constitution <laughs> and fall in love again with the document that created this country. It's, um, you know, we don't teach civics in class, any, you know, in high school anymore. And I think there's many generations that really probably haven't read the Constitution to really understand the beauty of the, of a democratic republic. And I think reading the Constitution just, you know, is not really a long document, but, but, but. Uh, you know, getting yourself familiar with it again. And also, you know, people are outraged. And I think after this our discussion and we know what's happening with um, um, money and politics, you know, being outraged is, is exactly what you should be. But I like to say start being constructively outraged. Again, people can be angry and angry and go nowhere with it. But if you're constructive, constructively outraged, um, then you start working what I call your circle of influence. And it's a... Be bold toolbox strategy that I have on my website, um, but it's 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 working your circle of influence. What can you influence about this issue, Mike? I, I found. Uh locally in Santa Cruz. I think my entry here was because I wasn't in city government and as a mayor and council member, but I, I do a lot of talks in public schools to middle school and high school kids, even elementary school kids. about the. I talk about the Bill of Rights, and uh, I, it's amazing how you know. I, I don't talk about it so much as I ask questions and I get the students talking. So I think it's you can find a place to share your concerns once you get active and start to learn what's going on. There will be opportunities to share what you know with others. I want to thank America America promises Johannes Epka and Mike Brodkin as our guests, and I hope you both can come back again sometime. Thank you, Johannes. Thank you so much, Jill. Such a pleasure, Mike. Thank you so much. Nice talking with you, and thanks for the sh- for the program, Jill. And thank you to you for joining us, and I hope you'll tune in next time on Be Bold America. On the next show, we'll be talking about the authoritarian playbook, What's Next? We will be speaking with Dr. Ruth ben Gayat, Professor of History and Italian Studies at New York University. She is a specialist of 20th century international and cultural history. She writes on war, fascisms, empire, authoritarian personalities, and the politics of images and sound. She's received Guggenheim, Getty, Library of Congress, and other fellowships. She writes for CNN, Huffington Post, and is often a TV commentator. Join us on Sunday, July 21st at 5 p.m. to learn more about the authoritarian playbook and what's next. I want to thank Emily Dunham, Be Bold America's program assistant, for her technical support. And another big thank you to our guests, Johannes Epka and Mike Rodkin. You're listening to KSQD 90.7 FM, Many Voices, One Station. And you may listen worldwide on Online at ksqd.org. My name is Jill Cody. Keep, stop, start.
You're listening to KSQD Santa Cruz 90.7 FM. Stay tuned for, um, for State of Mind coming up next. The views and opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of Natural Bridges Media or KSQD's staff, volunteers, or underwriters.